Can you describe, just for people getting to know you, uh, what your progression was like from your early presentations or early speaking to where you are now, where you're one of the most sought after speakers in the United States? So uh, my first ever talk was, I think, in 2017 or 2018. I was a full-time personal trainer. I graduated from exercise science degree, and I um, I always wanted to be a speaker, you know, and I didn't know what that meant. I just wrote motivational speaker as my secret question for your dream job, you know, and uh, I, I just felt drawn to it. I was like, I love the idea of being on stage. I just didn't know you could actually make money doing that. A buddy of mine was doing a nonprofit event in the diabetes space, and he's like, hey, man, we want to have a speaker. I don't have money, but I would love to have you come. You have a cool story. And I'm like, oh, man, I kind of always want to do that. I'll try it out. I did it. I did it in a cutoff. So I was like such a bro, such a fitness bro. Um, I did it. And uh, the video is actually on YouTube, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's on my YouTube. Um, I did it and everyone loved it. Great feedback. But when I stopped speaking, I was like, it was good, but I can do so much better. I was like, I didn't like the idea that I knew I could have done better. That drove me to learn about storytelling. I joined Toastmasters. I did all these things. And I was like, how can I learn? Like, is there a science to storytelling? Is there an art? How do I learn how to better tell this? What makes a good speaker good? Like looking at MLK speech and looking at Steve Jobs and Oprah and then looking at these great speakers, Bill Clinton, all these people who were fantastic speakers. I'm like, why are they good? And I just got obsessed with figuring out what made someone a good speaker. Fast forward to now, getting twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars to speak for 45 minutes is insane to me because back in the day, I wouldn't even get a thousand dollars. It's come full circle. And I've understood that when you solve other people's problems and you perfect your craft, the craft that you already do every day, I truly believe everyone has a $10,000 story already in their head. They just haven't let it out yet. And now that's my job to help people. When you, when you meet people for the first time, how do you like kind of coconut crack their heads to find the story within? I give them the stage or the floor or the zoom room. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me, talk to me. What's on your mind? What's top of mind for you? And they start telling me about their life. They start telling me everything about their story. Most people have overcome hardship. Most people have overcome something. And sometimes it's a good thing, but sometimes too much of a good thing is a bad thing. I think everything has a rate of limiting return or statistical bell curve. And Most people rely too much on what's happened to them and not enough on what they can do for other people based on what's happened to them. So what I ask them is, you know, tell me about what you've gone through. What, what kind of message do you want to tell? What do you want to teach? I have to drive into their head. It's not just about saying what happened to you. It's about the message that helps people. So what does that message look like? And a lot of people kind of want to serve a specific population. So I ask them, what can you teach them? What have you learned that you can teach them that would help them at any point in their life? And that's how I start to get the ideas. You can't build a great story or a great speaker unless you have a great core message that's actionable. Until you have that, I don't care how good you speak. I don't care how well you can teach story. You have to have a core message as a foundation. Is the core message, so when I think about deconstructing what you're saying, um, I would think that it's kind of like with marketing, like you start with business, you start with what the need is. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in business that will, they'll, they'll be uh, a technology in source of a problem versus a problem in source of a technology or solution to solve it. And what it sounds like, if there's like a little bit, like if I had a Venn diagram, it's almost like yours is like a little bit in the middle where that your core message has that like the solution and it also has that uh, problem kind of merged in at the same time. That's a good way to look at it. And I think it's really important to understand you have to have a core message, but that core message has to have a solution. And that solution has to be relevant to the problem that your audience faces. So perfect example, um, there is a step outside of that when we go into like professional paid public speaking that I'm sure we're going to dive into, but let's just start with those. If you want to speak on mental health, that's fantastic. Are you an expert in mental health? 
Well, no. Okay. Well, that might be tough. You you want to be an expert in what you speak on. So how can you validate your expertise? Is it because of a specific traumatic hardship that you've gone through? Are you a therapist? Are you a uh, a mental health counselor? Have you done HR in corporations and you feel like the mental health side of HR is something that needs to be talked about? There's so many ways to spin expertise. But if you don't truly believe you're an expert in it, let's be honest, should you be speaking on something you don't have an expertise in? That's a whole nother conversation. So just as you couldn't be in the NFL because you like playing football, you can't just speak because you like to talk. Does that make sense? So there's like, this is an obvious question that people probably ask all the time. Like, what are these early hurdles and challenges that you had in your career? I'm, I'm kind of like trying to reverse that, like reverse engineer that question by looking at some of the advice you give to other people. So one of those early hurdles that you've seen is developing that core message, making sure that there is an expertise there that is usable. And if you don't have the expertise, uh, how can we take your story and then probably buff up your expertise? Like, can you take some classes? Can you volunteer? You know, can you build that stuff Absolutely. up so that you can have the change you want to do? And so I'm trying, I'm trying to like figure out uh, if anyone was listening in right now, what are some of the things they can expect? What, what type of thing like hurdles that can they see coming that in your life that we can, you know, kind of talk about, let them like see them coming. So it's a little easier for them to handle. For sure. This is one of the easiest ways to figure out where your expertise lies or where your core message lies. Speak to the person you were five years ago. The person you were five years ago, if you have progressed, you are light years ahead of where you were. So you are teaching the person you were five years ago everything you've learned to get to where you are today. There are many people who are just like you right now as you were five years ago. So that's the group of people you can appeal to. What does that group of you five years ago look like? For me, I was a beginning speaker. I didn't know how to get paid speaking gigs. I didn't know how to charge more money. I didn't know how to identify my message. I just spoke. It was a great story. People still loved it. But how do you go from good to great? How do you go from speaking to becoming a professional speaker? And in the process of those five years, I found out not only what to do, but what not to do. I've made a ton of mistakes. Think about the mistakes you've made along the way over the last five years. Could you stop someone from making those mistakes? What, what would that save them? Money, time, effort? mental struggle, strain, that's fantastic. Now you have an actionable message to teach people because sometimes it's not just what you know, it's what you know not to do. The, mm -hmm. If we can prevent further loss, the inflation of that is gain, essentially. I was just thinking, the I don't think there's a, a wealth of people. This seems like an opportunity for people listening if they've experienced heartbreak or divorce or something like that. They, they could probably... Uh, be a paid speaker that goes around and talks about like the things that they did wrong or that they noticed. Cause usually it's uh the stuff I see, it's like, uh, it's usually like how to do things right. They don't really talk about the things that went wrong. They don't really like to not do focus. things wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I, I love that concept and that it kind of goes to where we're, we're skating in this conversation, which is let's take that divorce uh, example and like how to, you know, what not get divorced or something like that. Yeah. At any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. That's an actionable message, but, 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 but it is not a profitable topic unless you finagle some stuff. So I want to explain that in the speaking world, we have the paid to speak group. And then we have people who speak to sell things. There is sometimes a crossover, but I'm specifically talking towards this one group right now. In this mm -hmm. world, that alone, like how to not get divorced, a company is not going to pay you to speak about how not to get divorced. But a company might pay you on how to improve communication and your storytelling uses the story of your divorce to teach proper communication. Does that make sense? Yes. That message, core message has to be inside of a profitable topic, depending on where you're speaking. Now, the other side of the world is 
you just go on stages and speak. Maybe you're selling a course about how not to get divorced or a course about relationship therapy or your therapist. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a whole nother world in speaking. That's the amazing part about speaking. Do you want to be a speaker who gets paid to speak? Or do you want to be a speaker who speaks to sell products, courses, services? Both are possible, but those are two different tracks and they, they require a sense of individuality for both. Yeah. And I, just to circle back on what you mentioned about looking at some of the best speakers in history, I personally have been, when I look at how Martin Luther King speaks, like the, the, like he'll talk about like, you know, uh, like a, America and, and, and freedom is like a promissory note that's been default. And it's just like some of the language of it is so beautiful and so simple and how they'll talk about these large concepts uh, that I think a lot of it's probably harder for people today to really appreciate all the like just how amazing that is to take out these really complex things and make them simple and yet still resonant for a great deal of people and so i'm just kind of curious um uh, is is it if it's martin luther king or, or whomever is there uh is there someone who spoke that you studied that really impacted your life and what did you learn from them uh, in particular so uh obviously drastic different message so we're going to remove ourselves from the message but the shape and strategy of the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech is near identical to the shape and strategy of Steve Jobs' launch of the Apple iPhone. Hmm. If I could draw it, which I'll send you a picture after this podcast, but it starts off where we are, where we could be, where we are, where we could be, where we are, where we could be, and now that's the new normal. So it's normal, explosion, new normal. I have a dream that we go from here to here, that we go from here to here, that we go from here and stay here. Apple iPhone, where we are in the industry and where the Apple iPhone could bring us, where we are, where we could be, and this is where society will be. Very similar strategy, and so many talks mm -hmm. are the same strategy and shape. And when I listen to... Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, when I listen to Bill Clinton's incredible apology speech where he did not apologize once. Imagine giving a speech for an apology and you never actually apologize. Like, that is incredible. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Some amazing orders of our time, like Obama, incredible order, um, regardless of political affiliation, some people are just fantastic speakers. All the way back to Winston Churchill, a lot of these people, I've sat back and watched them like, why are you so good? Your language, your tone, your dynamic range, your ability to pause when you need to, intentionality, your ability to deliver points along a spectrum of a shape with intention to move me, not just through charisma, but through the course of action and the way you laid out your speech, fantastic. And I think that's a spoiler for anyone looking at this a year in the future or thinking about this right now. Something's coming up that's related to this with Chris that we're not going to talk about it, but there's a, there's a, some really exciting stuff coming up in Chris's life involving these types of things. But in comedy, there is uh, this thing where like the, I was thinking I was listening to Whitney Cummings talk about how if they were to get you into comedy, what would you do? And she said, I'd have you on stage tonight. I'd have you on stage tonight. He was like, well, I don't have any, you have not you have until you get on stage tonight to figure out what your material is. And then they, you know, crafted it from there. If someone wanted to speak, what would be the process from where they are now listening to us to speaking for the first time in a, either uh, for free or in a paid way? I imagine that's like, so much different. Yeah. We would identify who you're going to be speaking to and what, mm -hmm. well, first, what your core message is, what you want it to be, like what excites you, what you can teach and what you have personally learned, like in that kind of trifecta. When you get that core message, let's say you you teach communication to organizations to improve culture. Okay. What companies might benefit from that? Now you can start saying like, all right, who, who might I talk to? Of course, you're going to want to go for Facebook and Google and these big companies. The reality of those are very hard to break into, especially as first timers, finding smaller companies and simply messaging them saying, hey, are you the person that brings in speakers? You just need a foot in the door to get the conversation. And the problem, most people pitch slap people. And I love that phrase, pitch slapping, because it's yeah. what people do. They literally say, hi, my name is Chris and I'm a professional speaker and I uh, have a disability and I was on a TV show at The Rock and I actually speak. It. You said all of this in an email, five, six paragraphs looking like the next JK Rowling book. And they're like, sorry, wrong person. Or even worse, they just 
don't respond. Mm -hmm. Most people try and jump the gun. You have to have that core message. The reality is you probably need a website, a speaker website. If you are a speaker, I need to see proof that you speak. You can't tell me you're a podcaster and don't have a podcast. You can't tell me you're a YouTuber and don't have a YouTube channel. You tell me you're a speaker and you don't have any footage of you speaking. People are like, well, what do I do then? I haven't spoke, so how can I speak? Unfortunately, you have to do what I did and what a lot of speakers do. You have to speak for free and sometimes less paid gigs to get the content. One, to get the content. And two, to get the reps in. How do you really want to go speak on stage for $5,000 and shit the bed because it's your first time and you got stage fright? That would be terrible. You don't wait until game day to start practicing. You have to get the reps in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this um, Gary V. There's lots of like his social media where it's just his face and he's like responding to things. And I, I, I was reading, and I don't know if this is true, if someone out there can tell us, but apparently that's just like he'll just in between meetings, he'll sit down and they just fire off questions. He'll answer them real quick and then they chop it up and it's speaking. So like you could record yourself speaking to a room and no one's there but you're still speaking and it's being recorded you can put that online as something to prove Absolutely. that you can speak well yeah we are lucky to be in the day of social media which means you can practice speaking every day whether it's a podcast whether it's just a story on instagram or whatever medium you like to i find that a lot of speakers will do everything but speak which is really funny they write blogs They'll write long form content. They'll write short form content. They'll do everything but actually speak. And it's almost a way of avoidance. And I understand it because I did it in the beginning too. You have to be willing to find your local moose or elk lodge or find your local chamber of commerce or any local possible event or team and be like, hey, you know, I'm speaking and here's some free advice. Here's what I would do. Like, hey, I'm a professional speaker that's local, and I'm looking to give back to the community. I normally charge $5,000 to speak, but I'd be glad to do a pro bono talk for your team on this topic. Does that interest you? If so, when would be a great time to potentially connect? By offering something of value to them and doing it for them instead of for you, it definitely piques their interest. Now, I've learned to back end this process because... The only thing I ask if I do have to speak for free, I, at my stage of the career, I don't usually speak for free. I have a few pro bono events, but those are very specific cases. I say, in, instead of charging you my normal $5,000 rate or whatever you charge, all I ask is that you have a recording of the event for me. Now you're starting to build professional material and you're not paying for it out of pocket. Have I paid for it out of pocket? Absolutely. At certain levels, it requires more investment. And when you want to go from making three to $5,000 per talk to making 15 to $25,000 per talk, things have to change. You have to improve and level up. But when you're at the beginning, there is no reason you should do, be doing a Netflix production to get one video, spending 15, $20,000. There's no reason. And in this day and age, we are so obsessed with more and better and better camera equipment, better video, better, 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 better. It's at a certain point, you just have to start. Yeah, and I think the for most people, their phone is more than powerful enough. More than enough. It. Most phones yeah. are 4K it's crazy. now. It's like, you're fine. Yeah, and the battery will last a while, too. I've been experimenting on this because I'm setting up to do in-person interviews, and so I'm like, what equipment do I need? Apparently not that much, if you, if you want to be Fantastic. a little bit of a miser like me. Uh, there was a person on the show uh, about a year ago. Man, I'm blanking on the name, but we talked about photography, and she said that uh, she will take photographs for nonprofits. And it's just, she doesn't get paid at all for this. But the weirdest thing happened that she noticed is that the majority of her money came from people seeing that, seeing her work there. You know, I've thought about this a lot, like how often the nonprofits are so starved for help. They're so starved for love. And if you just give them a little bit of love, everyone sees you doing the love. And then it's just a multiplicative thing. You're doing a great thing. That's something that aligns with what you want to do, the change you want to see in the world. If it's mental health, I'm sure there's mental health nonprofits near you. They could do speaking or they could help them with something set up for their own speaking gigs or whatever. And people see you doing that. And it's just a, a quick little nexus for this one woman who talked about photography. It was like she was already, you know, successful enough. But then going to that, that's where it exploded. Now she has like a photography uh, where they hang them uh, in a galley, a ga that's galley cool. or whatever. That's amazing. All over the, all over the, all over the world in Japan, Canada, US, all over the place. 
It's pretty cool. That's fantastic. And that's what it, I had to put the reps in the beginning. Maybe I did a yeah. little too much, to be honest, but I did close to 30 events for free when I first started speaking. And I didn't know the process. I didn't really have the target in mind. I was just like, this is cool to be doing it. You know, people were inviting me to speak. They were paying for my airfare, which was great. But I, I thought that was enough. As you learn the speaking business, you realize that is not enough and you should definitely be getting paid for your time at a certain part. But when you're first starting, allow those events to come in when they do, because you capitalize on getting the video, getting your name out. I created myself as like a, a D-list celebrity in the diabetes space, and it's not a celebrity at all. It's just I became known in a very small space. You can do that in any specific space. You don't have to be famous. You just have to get popular in a very niche group that could be women who've experienced tragedy tragedy after 30 years old like it's such a hyper fixated group but when you start to own that group and help that group they support you and then you go from women who've experienced tragedy in the 30s to just women who've experienced tragedy and then just people who've experienced tragedy and you work outward from those small circles to bigger circles and that's how you become a really well-known and liked speaker because you service people first in specific groups and then you slowly broaden out instead of taking this Walmart approach of I speak on everything about overcoming adversity ever. I'm like, okay, you and every other speaker who has climbed Mount Everest or every other speaker who has done something hard, you know, what is your differentiator? And your differentiator in the beginning is going to be specificity, it's just what it is. And it's a it is a great feeling too. Like I've I've been doing the show for some time, and there there are some communities. Where like I'll walk into them, and they're just so excited. They're like, "Oh my gosh, Lowell's here!" It's like I just uh, interview people. It's not that big of a deal. But it's such but it's, it's, it's uh, so nice to be so focused. Yeah, it's a really great feeling for anyone listening in, feeling like any social anxiety about it. Uh, like niching in and creating that value for people. Like people are going to be excited for you to be there, and that's an amazing feeling. So wherever you are, and I think that. Uh, following on this it doesn't sound like it'd be that much time i think that like people could even today maybe they they uh record themselves doing their core message just record it put on tiktok you know social media like guys i need, I want you to beat the crap out of this what do you think this core message because i want to like help people that's kind of something i'm working on right now it seems like someone could take where they are now and over the course of like a week or two kind of like put the reps in making their own stuff and then do a, a, a something for free and then maybe uh, i don't know how quickly after that they can make it paid. I think that's more just like how well they are at negotiating. But it doesn't sound like this is something that um, it will take time to be great at it, of course. But someone listening in could could take where they're at and really start making those steps uh, tangibly within like a month. The real barrier to entry is mm -hmm. sitting down, decluttering your mind and saying, what have I learned in overcoming the hardest stuff that I've overcome? What is the skill set that I can teach other people to benefit from most? I have speakers as clients who are in very high up tech companies that talk about big data and AI. And then I have speakers who have experienced tragedy and lost limbs and, you know, such a drastic different type of speaker. But there's so many different kinds of speakers. Some are more technical on hard skills. Some are more uh, mindset driven on soft skills. You're not limited by what you can speak on. You're limited by the work you put in to find your core message. And if you give yourself that time of day to be like, okay, what have I learned? What are some of the biggest takeaways? If someone was going to ask me, what are the three biggest lessons you've learned in becoming the person you've become today? That's the kind of stuff we want to tap into, those deep-rooted things that you know, if a million people lined up and said, that's not true, it's not real, you wouldn't listen to any of them because you know it to be true. That is the conviction for the ideas and messages that we need. Mm -hmm. Sir, if there, for people who are getting really excited, I think, uh, is there any like challenges you'd give them? I think we were talking in the, the, the uh, we, we talked for a while before we hit record today, and uh, but the, um, the people sometimes need a little bit of a push. Mm -hmm. And then I think that then it's like, there's a, you can picture a person like with a big you know burden on their back and you just give them a little push and they just start kind of like momentuming forward. So is there anything that you'd encourage people to, to try out or challenge uh, more than, uh, I think maybe just operationalize what you just said, but uh, what, what challenge would you give anyone listening in who wants to try this out? Let's just do some live coaching real quick for a second. So sure. I'm going to ask you to fill in this blank, you know, and there's no wrong or right answers. This is not, don't get nervous. Mm -hmm. 
I help who do what? So positioning statement for speaking. Who do you help and what do you help them do? So let's take your podcast for an example. Who do you help and what do you help them do? I'm really focused on, uh, weirdly enough, I'm really focused on millennials, even though there's a lot of uh, the population listening. Everyone's loved here, but I really love <laughs> helping out millennials <laughs> uh, get excited about life. People, uh, if you're on TikTok, you're on news or any of these things, it's really easy just to get really kind of blanked. Like I, like wherever you are, it's just where you're going to be. And so I get to talk to all these great people and get people excited about the future, get, get their passions reignited, uh, reignited. So my, my big thing is I, I like to help out millennials. I like to get people excited for the future. And maybe like the biggest compliment I get is when people write me and say that because you're upset, I'm not doing coding. There's like a bunch of women, one, some of my first episodes that wrote in saying that they're not coding now because of an episode where someone described coding in a way that was approachable to them. And that's huge. So let's take that. I help millennials get excited about their life. Okay. That's exactly where we start. And you figured it out a lot faster than most people. Now let's take it one step further. I help who do what so that they can blank. So I help millennials get excited about life so that they can. Uh, find purpose. I think a lot of people aren't doing what they purpose. should be doing. There you go. Yeah. And, and that's it. Speaking can be that simple when it comes down to identifying a message. Who do you help? What do you help them do? And so that they can what? Mm. When I first started, I created this big overarching. Like I, I like to start, you know, all the way up top and then zoom in. I help people see their world without limits so that they can improve their quality of life. Great. Fantastic. We got, a, we got an overarching thing. Now let's make it a lot smaller. I help companies improve their internal communication so that ultimately they have better productivity inside and outside of the workforce. Hyper specific for an organization around community or uh, conversation communication or overarching when it comes to overcoming adversity or change management. I help people manage change so that they can finally get unstuck and do the things they've always wanted to do. There has to be a, who do you help? What do you help them do? And why? Mm -hmm. If you can figure out that three part thing, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Um, now you have direction, you have intention, you have specificity. That is your guiding purpose, your thesis. When you're making your talk, when you're talking like, Oh, you know, um, I went to the gym and I, I lifted a bunch of weight and I got a great pump and it was just so awesome. How does that go back to your core message? Oh, well, it doesn't. Then it doesn't belong. Yeah. That sentence is your guiding principle as you're speaking, as you're creating, as you're existing, as your own brand. Because if it doesn't coincide with your core message, to me, it's equivalent of trying to get better at playing basketball by practicing tennis. Your goals and your actions aren't aligning. The, it reminds me of a story where I was on a plane and there was a lady sitting next to me in economy class, which is going to matter when I, you know, when I say how much she makes. Her only job in this big company, she flies around, she sits down and mediates problems in teams. So like, uh, you know, someone, like some of them are apparently quite silly, like they didn't ask to like borrow each other's staplers and stuff. She got paid like $500,000 to do that. Such an like incredible thing. And a nice lady for being in the economy and, uh, you know, sharing her, her life with me. But there's a, uh, similarly to what you were just saying specifically, uh, Elon Musk has this, this uh, process it's from like a French philosopher, but basically delete it. And if it doesn't break, it wasn't supposed to be there. And then at the same time, in his recent book by Walter Isaacson, which I'm not a fan of, I think Walter was kind of a, a wuss there, but um, they did talk about this thing where he'll delete a lot. And if you, if you don't add back 15% of what you deleted, you didn't delete enough. So those two things are kind of interesting. Like how often do you, like I, I, a friend of mine just sent me a pitch deck. And I think my my my, uh, my critique my, my critique was too many words, <laughs> too too many words. It was like paragraph, paragraph. You could tell they were scientists. <laughs> paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. It's like delete so much. People aren't paying attention to all that. So so uh, that's funny listening. that you said that because my my main obsession. Ooh, I have it right here. Okay. My main obsession is this book right now. Subtract. Subtract. Oh my, my god! Thoughts. I'm obsessed obsessed with this book. Um, it's such a different concept from 
just less or minimalism and subtract. If anything, subtracting is takes more effort, a lot more effort than just doing less, because often when you subtract, you have to do more. Um, but in the age of constantly trying to add things, let's let's think about I want to speak. OK, so I need a professional camera. I need a professional mic. I need a professional light. I need uh, I need to buy some sort of story system. I need to buy like we just want to add, 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 add. What we really need to do is stop going on TikTok, stop going around and bullshitting, stop doing extra stuff and sit down and focus for an hour on what you would speak on. You don't have to buy anything. You just have to do less of the shit that's distracting you and more of the stuff that you haven't been doing at all, you know? So I love the idea of not just adding on to things because you can't scale a broken system to success. You can't. You really can't. And I love that concept. Yeah. It's interesting how often, I, I, sometimes effective communication isn't even saying anything at all. But there are many times where uh, I'll, there'll be like two times, like I'll talk a lot and I won't speak at all and I'll get, have the same outcome. And I think I think it speaks to the same thing that we're talking about, which is uh, it is going to surprise you how, if you're really focused about things, like what that feels like. Because like you could go into a situation and not say anything yet, it still goes out exactly what you wanted to be said, or exactly how you wanted it to go, which is kind part of, of cool. part of what I uh, teach some of my speakers. So we have the the business side of speaking, and then the storytelling mm -hmm. side of speaking. Some people are already great storytellers. We don't need much on the the speaking side of things. Some people need a little bit more work in the speaking and improving their speaking. I have people tell me a story, maybe a story they love to tell me, and then I have them reduce it and reduce it and reduce it to the point where it can be summarized in one sentence. It's a very tough challenge or process, but when you can take an, a, a, a very deep story and boil it down to a simple, simple concept, person went here, person experienced hardship, person overcame hardship, person succeeded. Now you can boil things down to concepts. And when you can boil things down to concepts, you have free reign over life and storytelling and speaking. It takes some work because you're kind of breaking down, subtracting or reverse engineering extravagance. And we're so used to loading things with details and kind of to your point, if you can delete it and it still didn't make a difference, did you really need it there at all? Think about, um, I've been posting a lot about LinkedIn lately. LinkedIn mm -hmm. has been like super huge for me and understanding copywriting. I fell in love with the art of copywriting because it's, it's the written version of keynote speaking to me. I love it. And something I learned is telling summarizes, but showing dramatizes and people love drama. You think about a scene in a movie when it flies in and there's a blizzard and the trees are just barren. And then there's a girl, you know, frosted hair, and she's shivering. She doesn't have to say, I am cold. It is cold. It is very cold. Mm -hmm. No words are said, but everything is communicated. How? Because showing is so much better than merely telling. Instead of me telling you, hey, you need to be more motivated. I can show you that when I was down on my luck, I didn't do anything for my life. I was I felt so sorry about myself until I just felt more comfortable with my hand and my disability. And then I started doing more and more. Now it got to the point where I did a TV show with The Rock. I, I'm able to go on these magazines and talk on podcasts like this. And the only thing that changed was I gave myself a chance to do the work. I don't have to tell you to be more motivated. Let me show you. And as speakers, it's our job to show, not just tell. Mm -hmm. Um. The, I think the I always look for ways to build that muscle. And one of the favorite, my favorite ways to with storytelling, especially when it comes to like synthesizing it, which is done for you, is Aesop's Fables and stuff yeah. like that. They literally yeah. give you a story in a paragraph or more, or like or less, like really, really tight. They literally give you the message. Absolutely. And, you know, like uh, the scorpion and the frog. There are times yeah. where I'm talking to someone. It's like, oh, well, why are you having a problem? It's like, well, you know, I tell I tell the story of the scorpion and the frog. It's like, I can't tell if this is your nature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so you're gonna funny. sting me in the head. <laughs> yeah fantastic though yeah are, do, are, um do you pull i think like uh, uh jim butcher who's a fantastic uh best-selling author he says if you want to understand mythology go to the kids section for mythology and, and find those books because they will tell I you very that. true yeah. yeah and so 
what are some ways, uh, strategies, books, whatever, uh, like that, that you use to kind of beef up storytelling? So I don't know that I have any specific books. I do love the book. Uh, st- I think it's Stand Stand Like Churchill, Speak Like Lincoln, or Speak Like Churchill, Stand Like Lincoln. Uh, mm. That book was really incredible for storytelling and uh, speaking in general in terms of being a great orator or narrator. Those two people were incredible, incredible speakers. Um, but in general, I more so put people through the ranks. I believe that there is some things you need to learn. I get that. But the majority of the time, people are so focused on learning or adding more and not doing the work themselves. I want you to make mistakes. I want you to struggle. I want you to have difficulty and have pen in hand and be like, okay, this is my story. Now remove yourself and tell me the same story. Now remove the specific events and just make it general. Now boil it down to one or two sentences. I want people to get the reps in and not just read about doing that, but actually doing it with your own stories. Now, can it help to do stuff like copywriting work where you actually rewrite people's copy and it helps you or you deliver a speech that MLK gave or a portion of it so you can practice intonation? Absolutely. That can definitely help. But at the end of the day, you have to have your core message. You have to know the concept of boiling your personal stories down to concepts. It takes reps and you have to put the reps in. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at the point where people are now should be at the point where they, um, it's like, how do you manage the stress of it? The memorization, the actual speaking of it. Uh, what is, what is your advice for people when they get up there for the first time or I'm, I'm picturing, uh, if anyone's watched the new Ninja Turtles, uh, uh, movie that was made by, uh, Seth Rogen or whatever his name is. And it's like the, the April like pukes if she's on camera. It's just like I, eventually like work through it, which is really great. But like, uh, yeah, for managing stress, what is, what's your go to there? So one, um, I believe there are two different types of people. There are people who are really good with improv and people who are really good with memorization. And vice versa. The people who are really good at improv are literally terrible at memorization. And the people who are really good at memorization are atrocious at improv. I have to decide or find out what kind of person you are. Can I give you a bullet point and you can riff off of it and feel confident? If so, great. You're more of an improv speaker. That's more my style. If you are a memorization speaker, that's completely fine. We're going to write out that speech and we're going to build it word for word. Both require a significant amount of practice, just in different ways. As an improv speaker, I need to know what my bullet points are. So when I write a speech, I have main, main, main bullet points. I will write out my speech and like what the main purpose of the talk is, what's my intro, what are my body points, what's my outro, what's my close. The two most important things are the intro and the close. They have to be strong. So once I know my bullet points, I can riff off. Yesterday, I was in an uh, event in Orlando speaking to 300 people. It was a completely new keynote. I've never done it before. It was to physicians. I wrote my intro, my bullet points, and my clothes. Killed it. Completely new keynote, but came off like that's what I do for a living is speak to physicians. That's because I've put the reps in. I've understood the process and how to build keynotes and how messaging comes across. If you're an improv speaker, you have to know your bullet points and practice your stories. Okay, if you have three points that you want to make, are you going to make a story with each each of those bullet points? What stories might you do for those? It's important to have those in in the realm so you know you can recall those in the moment. And then... It's important to practice, record yourself, practice on video, see what you do. Do you have any weird body motions? Are you getting stumped? Are you forgetting stories? Most people don't practice enough before they go on stage and it shows the other type of people, the people who need memorization. I have a few speakers I'm coaching that need memorization, not a problem at all, but those people I would argue require a lot more practice. Because when I'm trying to remember something that I said, it can feel a little more staccato and I'm now recalling my memorization instead of speaking naturally. To go from memorization to true delivery, you have to know it so well that 
you need to still be able to give emotion. And you need to be able to pick up your voice and drop it when it matters most. You have to have that dynamic range. And the only way you'll have that is if, if you're recalling memorization is if you practiced enough. The biggest issue I see with memorization speakers, they don't practice enough. And they only practice enough to remember what to say and not remembering how to say it. That's a big issue. Mm -hmm. So got to decide who you are, improv or memorization speaker, and then we adjust accordingly. Do you mnemonic the parts that you need to remember, let's say improv, or um, or is it written down in a way where you can see it? So the, again, there are multiple strategies depending on what you're mm -hmm. most comfortable with. One of the easiest strategies, especially for beginning speakers, is to have placeholder slides. One word, one picture, some sort of mnemonic device as a slide, and you see it out of your peripherals, or if you're lucky to have a stage that has the uh, screen on the bottom of the stage. Your Alexa routine. Okay, I'm gonna Alexa, make a note to this part. Of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wait, fantastic. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, motioning for myself in the future to delete this part. <laughs> delete <laughs> no, Alexa worries. getting excited. <laughs> no worries. You're good. So, um, I think it's really important if you do have one of those stages, if you're lucky to have a stage that has a monitor on the bottom where you can kind of see, otherwise, you can always glance to the side very quickly. Uh, if you have slides, um, that can help remind you where you're at. And if you know certain core keywords of your talk, which you can memorize five words, those are going to trigger the stories, the messages, or the images that you have are going to trigger those stories and messages. So that helps. Same thing with memorization speakers. A presentation can help keep you on track. But I think you said earlier, you know, someone gave you a proposal. It was like super crazy. Presentations are not the speech. They should have no more. Honestly, I hate more than five words on a slide unless it's a quote and it better be a damn short quote one. You are there to speak, not have people read off the slides. Something I always hated as a kid when I was going to college and it, it encouraged me to not go to classes. I am not paying the teacher to read the PowerPoint slide to me. One, I read faster than you're speaking. And two, I need you to teach me your way, not just what's on the screen, because I can read that at home by myself. I don't need you to read to me. I can read. Don't make the crowd read to you. They're there to hear you speak, not regurgitate what's on the slide. So I always have a rule. If you are going to use slides, which a lot of times, I'll be honest, I don't use slides. If you are going to use slides, make sure they support your talk, not the other way around. You're not supporting the slides. The uh, something I recently read is that uh, Jordan Peterson, who's known for giving really long talks, apparently it's not prepared. He like just goes out there with kind of like a theme and just like talks off. And he's like, "Well, that's wild." He's like, an improv-based speaker, and yeah. his <laughs> when he speaks about his messages, they uh, they always have ta ta tales or tags that continue on to the next one. You know, it's a cascading effect, and. Mm -hmm. It's a very natural conversational style, kind of like we're talking here. Even though you have semi-preparation, you don't know what I'm going to say. And sometimes what I say triggers you to react. So when you can do that with yourself and stay on target, always having that thesis of what is the main goal, you have to be able to pull yourself back because the last thing you want, I've done this before in the very beginning, is to go so far off a tangent that by the end of the talk people are like yeah what was that about but it was good but what was it about i remember someone interviewed people at an obama speech and uh the lady was like enthralled you know and the guy was like oh did you like obama's speech she was like it was amazing it was so good it was incredible and he was like great what was your favorite part of the speech she was just like it was so good. I loved it. He was just so amazing. And he's like, all right, was there a part that really caught your attention? She's like, I just loved how he just like was, he was just so good, you know? And the guy was like, okay, okay. And he was really showing that a lot of times some people can use so much charisma that people might not even pay attention to the actual talk. They're just enthralled by the charisma itself. Make sure when you're speaking of very, very, very clear points and people walk away with that one message that you want them to walk away with. What do you want me to leave with? With this keynote, with this uh, podcast, 
you want your audience to walk away with, okay, if I wanted to speak and get paid, what would potentially be the process of getting there? That's the core reason we're talking, which is why I'm not going to just venture off and talk about, oh, if you're going to do virtual keynotes and you can get this kind of microphone I have right here, this microphone's really good and then it has this cord and then cords, unnecessary, unnecessary. Focus on the core message, core solution that your audience needs. Mm -hmm. Actually, speaking about uh, virtual keynotes, is there any like big difference between the two, like in person or virtually in terms of just like the business of professional speaking? So in terms in terms of money, like there's incredible money in virtual keynote speaking Mm. Um, with anything to get paid more money. You generally need to start getting some better equipment. You start to have better quality. It's a different animal because when I tell a joke, no one laughs. You have no feedback, nothing. Mm -hmm. You can still sometimes set up the screens if you have all the equipment to see people, but there's still no audio. And most people, some people stand up, but most people sit down when they're doing virtual keynotes, which is a different feel too. Um, There are different components of a virtual keynote, but it is a huge business. I have a thing called a stream deck, which I can like control all these different settings and have polls come up and make it interactive a lot of these questions are not, can you do it? It's, are you willing to do it? And are you willing to do the work to scale it to where it, it will get where you want to be as it is right now with the equipment I have, I can charge around $10,000 for a virtual keynote. And I've gotten nothing but five star reviews after those events. I've done events for 5,000 plus people on virtual events. Really cool. And I still do it in my office. You know, I don't really have to leave home for it. I know some people who do them in studios and they do $15,000, $20,000 virtual events. I'm not trying to do all that, to be honest. I love in-person events, but I know people who are just virtual speakers. You get to make this whatever way you want, but whatever way you choose to make it, you have to lean into it. You can't be a little of everything ending up with nothing good. Whether it's virtual or in-person, you have to have the core message. And I'm going to keep going back to that because... It's so important, but so many people like to skip step one of any goal because they want to end up at the finish line without running the race. And a, a, another thing to be concerned about, I, I imagine, is also, like you said, like uh, spreading yourself out too thin. There's a, a lot of businesses think more is better. <laughs> like, oh, well, like, I'm so glad you brought I, that up. Yeah, I have a friend who I was just having it because I'm working on a new business. And um, uh, they're like, well, but if you do this, you can have like more. But yeah, but if I focus on these people, it's better, it's better and it's, you know, better margins and stuff. Man, so I, I've been talking about this almost every day. I find myself talking about this and it that must mean something. I have to write a book about this some way. More is not a place. Mm. More doesn't exist. And what I mean by that is you can never get more. Because more is a carrot on a stick. When you go after it, it moves. So whether you're a boss or a leader or talking to yourself, when you tell yourself you need more or to do more, it's an impossible task. You're setting yourself up for failure. People who are obsessed with getting more money will never have enough money. And I forgot who said it. I believe it was Seneca, but don't quote me directly. Uh, Enough will never be enough. For the man who doesn't have enough. Hmm. The idea of like, oh, I need to exercise more. What does that mean? What does that mean? I need to eat more healthy food. What does that mean? Like one piece of broccoli, a hundred specificity matters. So instead of saying I need more, I need to do more and be specific. I need to practice speaking three times a week. I need to walk four times a week for 20 minutes. I need to eat four servings of vegetables a day. You have to be specific because more is not a place. And that drives me nuts when people even use the word more because like it's just such an ambiguous thing that most people who say they need to do more of something never do any of something. Mm -hmm. It's like the paralysis by analysis. Oh my God, drives me nuts. I I, I think that from a marketing standpoint, uh, like I think three channels you know, three ways of marketing a, a quarter. That's a lot. I think you a, know, lot. a lot of times, I like a lot of times, because uh, I used to do marketing consultant, and I would, I would be like, let's just focus on one. But we're like, but well, we're going to put all this money into it. It's like, yeah, imagine all that money 
with like a laser. You know how powerful that beam would yeah. be. You know? Yeah. Versus a shotgun. You know, shot shotgun yeah. really doesn't kill people. You know, like, and really, that's yeah. most people's most people's uh take on whether it's marketing, speaking, business, fuck anything, spray and pray. And instead of being more direct, now it's important to get the reps in, yes. But there, there is a balance and we're just so extreme with things like, oh, if I want to be a good speaker, I have to speak on everything and do everything and be everything. And Okay. There is a space between doing everything like shit and doing literally nothing because you want to be perfect. There is a space mm-hmm. and it's called moderating that. You have to moderate yourself. If you want to be a speaker, it means you're probably an adult. So you need to be an adult and say, hey, I need to focus on these three things this amount of time so that I can get better at this over this course of time specificity helps people with adherence and accountability and just action. So it's really important. Yeah. So we've got pre interview, pre speaking prep. We got in the interview, manage your emotions, how to, you know, speak. Uh, what do you do after the interview? What, sorry, not interview. What do you do after speaking? Yes. What do you do after speaking? Is there uh do you have strategies or like processes when it comes to the business side of it? Like, you know, really uh, cementing that good relationship. Um, I imagine you're definitely reflecting and and sometimes watching the video, sometimes just seeing how you know the crowd uh, does stuff. But what's the post speaking process look like? Yeah, and I'm I'm glad you brought up the connection thing. Um, initially, my my knee jerk reaction was to say, there's the business side of post speaking, and then the connection side of post speaking. But the connection side is is the business side too. I always tell my event planners that book me, I'm going to speak for 45, 60, 90 minutes, and I'm going to deliver this message. It's going to be so valuable to your audience. But after I speak, I always stay around at events and talk to people. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the people who weren't willing to ask questions when I were on stage come running to me and form a line to talk with me talk with me, hug me, take pictures, maybe buy books if I'm selling books or uh, connect with me or share personal stories about them based on what I was speaking on. And I always give people my time of day. That's, I think, what separates me or differentiates me from most speakers. I don't just fly in and fly out. I always take extra time to speak to people at my events to show them that they're important. I spoke for 60 or 90 minutes. It's now my turn to listen. And I found that by listening to people, not only do you become more likable, you build better connections. The best way for people to think you're interesting is to be interested in them first. The problem is with society today. We say, if they don't do it for me, I won't do it for them. Be a leader. You're a speaker. You are already that authority figure on stage. By this time, people want to share their stories with you now. It's your time to listen. That is such a vital a component of why I get rebooked to speak. A $10,000 event is amazing. A $10,000 event four years in a row, it's much more amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, reminds me of the guy who wrote Fight Club. He said that what he'll do when he, he's at the point where he likes his story is he goes out to a cocktail party, goes out somewhere, and he'll tell the story. And, he, and then he'll wait for people to tell their stories. I love that. That's when he knows it's a good story. Because like, yeah. if you say something, people are just like, you know, <laughs> it's not good. That's how you know. It's like the listening is almost like you're saying. It's like the the qualifying event to let you know you really had a good uh, good uh, speaking. Absolutely, there has to be some sort of tale that gives people an opportunity to counter share a story where that inspires some sort of messaging. Whether it's them coming up to you and saying, "Hey, that thing you said here." And you're like, I didn't even think that was a big deal. You're like, that changed everything for me. That strategy you gave, I'm going to bring back to my team. And I feel like that's going to really help us. Or they're just like, you know what? My kid has this. And I just listen. Or they just like, hey, I just want to come and say thank you, man. It really, that really meant a lot. All of those are valuable insights, not only to your messaging, but to see if someone, I learned quickly, and this is really good for data collection too, for you to see how well you're speaking. I have, let's say 99% of the time, I've always had people come up to me after I speak, which is a good sign. You had some sort of impact for people to come up to you. But when I first started speaking, 
the majority of the comments I got were, oh my God, you were so amazing. That was so inspiring. That was incredible. And it sounds good. It sounds really good. But as I started to examine that, I was like, oh my God, I'm literally just talking about myself and people just think I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. That was a short burst of inspiration for them. That was dopamine cocaine for them. And then it did nothing for their life. It just made them feel good about my story for a little bit. And I was like, I hate that. I hate just being inspiring based on telling my story. So when I learned to do the actionable message, when I learned to really focus on solutions, now the majority of people come up to me like, that thing you said was incredible. I, I was really struggling with this. And now I feel like that's a solution. And I'm like, man, that that fires me up every time I hear someone say like, something I said or an idea I gave them allowed them to think about a problem or tackle a problem differently. Like to me, that's success. And it has the, like you're, you're sifting for more stories too. Those yes. people who come and you're listening, you're hearing more opportunities to present, you know, tailor what you're saying even more. Finally. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's like the storytelling never ends. Like you're always looking for those stories to tell. Absolutely. Which is, yeah. The, is there anything that you've done when it comes to just like building the relationship? I think a lot of people don't put enough stock in the relationships. And I think like even you a minute ago were like, yeah, that's the, that's a, that is the business. Or is there any, how do you, can you tell me about like your process for that? Like, like I, I think it's something that people really sleep on. They, they'll do the thing. They'll say, thanks. They go about their day. Um, they do it on my show all the time. Uh, you know, so I, I always follow up with people and let them know how it goes. But like uh, people only follow up when they want something for me, which is fine as well. But uh, how do you build those relationships? Because so, repeating customers are so much better than just one-offs. So for me, it's vital start to finish the, the process. And I make sure it's professional, but also authentic in the connection. I always get on a video call when I can. Majority of the time I can. I could probably sell through email because they ask, what are your prices? What do you do? I could just email them back, say this is what it I never do that. I I say, let's get on a call and I get to know them in their organization and who they are as people and what the real struggle is. I have real conversations with them. We joke, we laugh, we talk like real people. One, that helps solidify me into this company. And two, now I'm building rapport. Before we pitch prices, before it's transactional, it's conversational. That has been vital for me getting my foot in the door. And once I know them and we've already had a chance to joke and talk and laugh, when I finally meet them, I continue that conversation. I pick it back up. They see me at these events speaking, you know, doing well, but then also connecting with their audience, talking with them again. If I can, I'll also go to dinner with them. I will do as much as I can to spend as much time FaceTime with them as possible because one, they, they enjoyed my business enough to bring me in. The least I can do is give them my time. And by doing that, we're in a day and era of people who don't give their time to anyone because they're so busy with everything else. Giving someone 10 minutes of your time can do so much, you know, for your business, for your health, for your sanity, um, just for humanity. So I'm always big on making sure I spend that face time with people. Yeah. So then it's probably not good or advisable to have like, several speaking gigs in a day like you you wouldn't be able to do the qualitative feeling of building those relationships it also seems like it'd burn you out probably a lot. you definitely you definitely can burn out now there are some speakers who really pride themselves in that and like hmm. if you're in the school speaking space or educational speaking space i have a buddy who does like 130 events a year crazy he's insane um but in the education space that's kind of what you need to do to get that kind of volume and it's easier to get those events so um as long as you impact like the kids like that, the teachers love that. And it's, they, they love seeing that connection. So I feel like it's a little different in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. I have had days in the middle of my career where I remember keynoting in the morning in Pittsburgh and keynoting in the night in Texas. And that was a very rough day. But even when you have limited time, you can still pause for a second and not rush people. If, as long as you can control the environment, you can still ask questions. You could still do one extra step instead of like speaking like, all right, I got to go. I'm like, hey, I really appreciate you having me. Honestly, like that was incredible. I have an event actually in Texas later tonight. 
I'm excited for that. But this meant so much to me, you know, this person said this, this person said this. What do you think the biggest takeaway was from the talk? I'm giving this person an extra three minutes, but I'm, I'm focused on them. I'm not turning my body language away from them. I'm not just like, yeah, 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 yeah. The smallest amount of effort. You have five minutes. I promise you, if you don't have five minutes, you're probably going to be late to the airport anyways. The smallest amount of effort plays such a huge role in relationship building and relationships will take you from just a transactional business to a viable, sustainable business. Yeah. And then uh, when it, you mentioned you like to get on the call, do FaceTime, um, what all needs to be bundled in like a package when you're sitting down negotiation? I think there's so many, like a whole conversation be on just how to negotiate. Um, anyone out there read never split the difference if you want to just so shortcut that Fantastic. Like, what things should be in, <laughs> what, what things should be included uh, in a speaker's fee like some, some stuff that the people should think about that maybe they don't aren't aware so uh, I pride myself I have a proprietary system my speaker proposal system is like mm. the reason I've been able to turn specifically $3,000 keynotes into $54,000 proposals that have recurred year after year for the third year in a row the, that first call, that discovery call, that first contact is to find out what they're really struggling with. It's not to sell them what you offer. It's to find out what they need. You have to let go of your needs to find out what they need. And I think we talked about before this podcast too, sometimes what people say they need is not actually what they really need. So ask deeper questions. Okay. Yeah. We want a speaker. Cool. What's the biggest issue that's going on in your organization right now? Well, we're really struggling with communication, but also just the culture has been, everyone feels like they're in silos. I'm like, okay, so communication is one component, but also the connectedness of the employees is another. Yeah, okay. What have you feel like you've done that's really helped? Like, well, we tried to do some employee resource groups and it's not really taken off. I'm like, okay, so you have the employee resource groups, but they're not really like going how you wanted them to. We have three major things we can touch on right here. The person just said they wanted a keynote, but they also told you there's so many more issues going on. If I speak in these areas and can help, why would I not propose things like speaking, but also follow-up training calls, consulting, some sort of uh, interpersonal connection regularly, maybe social media? What skills do I have that could service their needs? I'm not trying to force my skill on them. I'm trying to solve their problems with the tools that I have in my toolbox. And I propose everything, everything. Uh, the one phrase I use commonly, free advice here, additional considerations. Mm. I make lots of, lots of money based on additional considerations because they're only additional considerations if they still solve the problem that they told you. If you are just trying to solve random problems they didn't tell you about, that proposal is gonna come across so salesy and so terrible. Listen, the best speakers listen and solve. Listen and solve. Hmm. Is there, when it comes to the contract, is there anything special sauce there? Is it just like something like a lawyer would whip up? Yeah, so special sauce being, make sure you get everything you need. Do you need a video? Great. Are they going to just repurpose your keynote and sell it or use it forever? There has to be some sort of licensing or control in terms of like, what are your rights to that footage? You don't want them using your main keynote publicly because if it's available publicly, there's no exclusivity. So I try and control making sure my keynote is not public. Um, I make sure that they know I need a lav mic or a countryman mic instead of a handheld because I have one hand. It's very hard for me to speak with a handheld. I put my requirements in there. I'm not a diva, but if I need a flip chart, I need a flip chart. I can't go from here to Nebraska with a flip chart. That's not going to happen. You know, I make sure that lodging, travel, everything is covered within reason. Okay. I am not a person who just takes for first class flights. Some companies will pull out all the bells and whistles. I had a company fly me first class to Berlin. That was incredible. Trust me, that was amazing. I've also flown on Spirit to go to New Jersey. Like it's not all bells yeah. and whistles, you know. Some speakers get a little bit more hoity toity and I'm like, huh. That to me it's just my personal opinion. I'm like, I'm very chill. 
you can be as specific as you want, but the more resistance you create, the more resistance you might get. I've created my contract to just say what I basically need and uh, how to introduce me. Here's my bio. I give them everything they possibly need to make their jobs easier. That way, from that one contract, there is no question on what I speak on, what I'm speaking on, what I'm wearing. I put everything they could possibly need. Pretty much turned an FAQ into a contract. That's uh, uh all right. So I think we're coming to the end. So I want to uh, hit you with some rapid fire. Let's do it. Uh, fun ones. Uh, at least I think they're fun. Uh, you're welcome. To say skip if you think these are boring. Um, uh, favorite place you've spoken at, and why does it hold that special place in your heart? Favorite place I've spoken at was Ghana and Uganda in Africa. Mm. I spent 14 days there at a diabetes camp that had people from Ghana, Uganda, South Sudan, and Congo. And it went from, they were literally terrified of me because I'm like this huge white guy with a prosthetic arm to doing a sports camp with them. And it was translated in multiple dialects as I was doing it, but I was talking about overcoming adversity and I used money as an example because everyone understands that concept. And it went from them being afraid of me to them like laughing, playing, loving me and stuff. And it was just such an impactful time to talk about a condition that we were connected through worlds away. Incredible, incredible experience, you know, uh, definitely, definitely one that I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, do you ever get uh, an, in, share an unusual or unexpected speaking request? Um, unexpected speaker. Oh yeah. God, I had one. They had me speak at a, uh, a fitness event. And it was in the back of the fitness event on the sidewalk and they wouldn't turn the music down. That was my worst <laughs> speaking experience ever. I was spoke to, I was a, supposed to speak two days in a row. I spoke the first day. It was horrendous to the point where I refunded half of their money. And I said, I'm going home. Hmm. Literally worst experience of my life. I've never talked about that, but I hated that experience <laughs> so much. I've only had that one event out of hundreds of events I've done that I was like, this is the worst shit I've ever experienced. So if you guys know who you are, that was terrible. It's terrible. But everyone else has been amazing. Yeah. I heard a story of a person in a trailer park that uh that their neighbor put their dog on their side. So they'd always have the dog like kind of like scratching at their windows. And so he went out there and said, Hey, I'll give you fifty dollars if you put your dog on the other side. And when we leave, you can have that fifty dollars. I'll give you another fifty dollars. And all you have to do is just put the dog on the other side. And so the guy was like, why would I do that? You know, why would I, why would I do to them what I'm doing to you? Like, why I put all this effort in? It's like, they're, they're not offering you 50 bucks. <laughs> and the person That's put it on the other crazy. side. And so, so I wondered, you know, to what extent you could have been like, uh, you know, like, uh, I'll give you 50 bucks, like move this, move the speakers, turn them off. Or like, maybe I probably could. It was just such a, that event. I think about it. And sometimes there's one picture I have in my camera roll that comes up and I see it and I'm just like triggered PTSD, like post-traumatic <laughs> speaking disorder. I swear. Yeah. Awful. Awful. Do you have a dream collaboration, whether it's a specific okay. individual organization or event? Um, I mean, I still want to do Ted talk. I want to do all that. I've been kind of like waiting on that, but I really would love to speak for Google. I think that would be pretty incredible. Um, that's high up on my list, Google and Unilever. I've done some work with degree for adaptive deodorant. And I think speaking to Unilever, the parent company would be really incredible. Hmm. If you, if you could, if you could, I'm mildly dyslexic. This is hard. If you could only, I wrote these things. If you could only do one thing to improve your speaking, what would it be? Pause more. Hmm. It was a good pause, pause too. Most people don't pause, they ramble. Pausing more creates intention. It creates power. For my main keynote, I don't speak for the first minute and 15 seconds while I'm on stage. The room is pin drop silent. By the time I speak, I have every eye, every ear in the room. Pausing is power. Speaking more is not power. In Shark Tank, apparently when they first walk up, they're made to stand there for a while. And uh, Kevin O'Leary says that he stares at them just as uncomfortably as he can and sees what they do. It's oh, yeah. Like, uh, it's like two minutes of just sitting there. And it's, people are very, people are not used to, uh, to silence. They're not. And that's when I speak to people, I'm very, pausing is really important to me, but so is eye contact. So 
it's almost like a game where I'm like, I'm going to win this because I'm very comfortable in silence. And when you can get more comfortable in silence, you get people's attention. When you go on stage, whether you're a speaker or a teacher or someone in a meeting and there's a lot of noise, don't be that person who's like, quiet down, everyone, quiet down. Awful advice. That's awful. It's coming from a position of weakness. If you want to come from a position of power and control and authority, you stand in front of the room and you don't say anything until everyone is pin drop silent. It will happen and it might take some time, but it will happen. People are like, oh, oh, hey, yo, oh, stop, 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 stop. Hey, sh- 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 sh-. And it goes dead silent. You pause an extra second, you don't address it, and then you start. Everyone is like, all right, this person owns the room right now. And that's how you own every room you're in. So then the last question I have for you is, is there, for people listening in that want to get into speaking, we've given us so much great advice, you know, pitfalls to avoid, you know, how to, how to find your core message, all these different things. Is there any final little push, any little bit of advice that you'd like to leave them with to, to hopefully push them out there to, to actually do the speaking versus just, you know, listen to us talk about it today. Yeah. So real quick, um, over the past five years building my speaking business, I've gone from struggling trying to build the speaking business to getting the most money that anyone in my family has ever gotten. I got my dream car. I got all of the stuff, you know, I, I got the money goals, which was great, but now I have the time freedom. Now I work realistically on average, less than 15 hours a week to get the kind of money that comes with being a speaker at this level is incredible. The freedom, the ability to travel, see the world, but also share your ideas and impact organizations from the top down and people from the ground up. You have a six figure story in you right now. It exists. Someone is willing to pay for the story you already have. The problem is it's in your head and not written down. When you can turn that story into a core message and you can just simply start pressing record and developing that and give it to a local association or a local organization and get that footage and put it on a cheap website, you are enabling yourself to start that six-figure story process. You're already that speaker. I help people become that maybe a little bit faster, but if you do the work, you can do it by yourself or you can work with someone like me and speed it up. At the end of the day, don't let that story die with you. You can change the world or at least someone's world. And if you do uh, and you share it anywhere, uh, tag Chris or myself and uh, we'll, uh, you know, I'll, if you tag me, I'll, I'll send it to him as well. So, you know, that'll make it easier. Tag uh, me, Chris, tag him. I'll give you free advice if you tag me on it. I'll just throw that out there. Sweet. Uh, and then, uh, Chris, thanks so much for coming back on. This is the second time being on the show. And I appreciate you sharing so much of your valuable wisdom today. Of course. Thanks for having me, man.